Um, I'm going to jump into this now, and I want to make some comments a little different than this topic at the end, so I'm going to go through pretty fast. I've, uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I've got notes as complete as I thought you would need in the notes section of the PowerPoint. Um, and I will try to point those out as I go through as well. But otherwise, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. So this is our goal with alfalfa, um, is to have a beautiful stand, clean leaves, no leaf disease, very healthy. Uh, but frequently, um, we don't see that. We, we do get um, foliar diseases, foliar and stem diseases that infect the plant. All right. Um, now, um, just a general comment, leaf and uh, stem diseases are usually considered more minor than the major five or six diseases that affect the crowns and roots of alfalfa, which can be catastrophic, as we saw this past year, uh, not to mention just plain water logging, but the wet soils bring along a lot of pathogens give the environment for pathogens to do their work on the root and crown diseases. So breeding has centered, focused in the last 20, 30 years on those more catastrophic, catastrophic diseases. But these foliar diseases do uh, reduce our yield, can reduce our yield and quality. Uh, there are many different pathogens, many different things that can attack the leaves and stems. Um, in a study uh, that included Ohio data that Dr. Laney Rhodes did a number of years ago, 46% of all harvests were affected by foliar diseases in this six state study. And there was a 19% yield loss on average in those affected harvests. So it's, it's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, in Ohio, the yield loss ranged from 3% to 23% when there was a presence of foliar diseases. Okay, so they do reduce quality. If you think about the, the leaf being affected, that is the energy engine of the plant that's absorbing carbon dioxide, that's doing the photosynthesis work of the plant. So anything that reduces that capacity to take in carbon dioxide is gonna re weaken the plant eventually and definitely affect yield. And of course, quality because our foliar, the, the leaves are the highest quality part of the plant. Okay, there is some genetic resistance in um, different varieties, but it's not regularly evaluated, not a big focus yet of the breeding programs. It varies a lot depending on, you know, the disease. Um, but there is some varietal resistance, so you'll see some differences in varieties. But again, there isn't any readily available information on that, so we have to rely on other, thank you, on other tactics in order to um, try to manage these diseases. So what, what I talk about these diseases and most diseases, in fact, over time is this idea of cumulative stress load in alfalfa, and these foliar diseases add to this stress load. The idea is that multiple stresses over time weaken the plant, eventually leading to death. Sometimes, like I mentioned, the disease can be catastrophic, um, but this is more the normal pattern. So in the first year, when you're seeding, say a spring seeding, you expect about half the normal yield of a production year. After the first year of full production, the year after spring seeding, you get your highest yield usually and then it starts to decline after that. And this is based on real data in variety trials. So by the third, fourth year, by the fourth year, you're losing 20% yield of what you got initially in the first full production year. So, and this is just uh, the effect of these cumulative stress load stresses taking their toll on plants over time, starting to lose stand, weaken the plants that do exist, they put out less stems, and, and so forth. So as the grower manages, plants good varieties, has good drainage, does everything he can, um, 
to take care of these major problems, then leaf diseases become more of an issue. They become the next limiting factor. So that's kind of the idea here as well. All right, now, the next few slides are just going through some of the more common ones that we will see in Ohio. Um, I need to uh, use some of these images for our next uh, edition of our field guide. I got these from uh, a USDA researcher in Minnesota here this past month. Um, so these, this can be just a good resource for you to have on hand as well. The, the images are pretty good quality, I think, uh, in, in this PowerPoint. So keep that, you know, as a resource uh, in your back pocket if you run into these things. So again, these are pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to uh, grind through them with you here this morning because I want to get to a couple other things. But uh, so downy mildew, wet and cool conditions in the spring. Alfalfa mosaic, you'll see this is a virus. Um, you, you know, there's, there's nothing really you can do about this. Um, just be aware of what it looks like, kind of this striping in the leaves. There's a lot of different viruses. Um, spring black stem and leaf spot affects both the leaves, the leaflets, and the stem. Again, this is in periods of cool and uh, wet in the spring, so mainly in the spring through June, early summer. Uh, you get blackening spots, dark spots on the stem that can coalesce and then become like large black spots on the stem can actually kill the stem. And then this uh, disease can overwinter on dead stubble, and uh, that's how it reinfects the crop the next year, or between cuttings. Common leaf spot is also favored by cool and wet weather. Um, I'm not going to go through all the symptoms there. These are all pretty distinct. If you uh, take a look at the symptoms in the, in the field, and uh, then look at these pictures, you can probably get pretty close to what's going on. Lepto leaf spot is more in the summer that you'll see it. Um, starts with small spots with a kind of a yellow halo, uh, large ye yellow halo. This one often is associated with potato leaf hopper yellowing as well when conditions are right for this disease and you have leaf hopper damage, you'll see a lot of this on those yellow leaves. And together they make it really yellow. Okay. Uh, again, it's it can be a problem all through the year, but I see it more in the summer, actually, even though it's favored by cool wet weather, I do see it kind of in those cool summer days, even in the middle of the summer. Just some more images of it up close. Summer black stem is more of the summer version of the black stem. It's a different uh, pathogen. Um, it develops under high humidity in a dense canopy in the second and third crop mainly. The lesions can coalesce, enlarge, cover most of the stem and the leaf. Now, anthracnose. This is a primarily stem and crown disease. It starts in the stem, a very characteristic, a very characteristic uh, diamond-shaped lesion with a black border. Um, and you'll get a shepherd's crook on the top of the stem, and, and the stem and the leaves turning um, brown, kind of this whitish straw color. This was one of the major diseases that the breeders worked on, and it was virtually eliminated for many years. You would not see it compared to when I first started as a grad student uh, working on alfalfa uh, back you know, 25, 30 years ago. But we have a new race that's coming in, and we're starting to see it under the right conditions more, and we've seen this in Ohio. Um, not this past summer, but the summer before, we had a fair amount of it. And it can 
move down into the crown and actually kill plants. So it's a little more severe than most of our foliar diseases when it does happen. You will lose stand with it. Uh, rust, again, uh, another, uh, another uh, foliar disease. Uh, pretty easy to tell this one with an orangish red color. Okay, uh, spreads north each winter or each summer, each year. Stemphilium, um, there's five different pathogens that can cause uh, this one. And uh, it, it's pretty distinct by the, the symptoms on the leaves. Um, got the description there. Again, occurs throughout the growing season. Okay, so managing these diseases, these are all very general things that a producer can do to manage any of the diseases. Of course, starting with good quality seed because some of these pathogens can be carried on the seed or in the seed. Drainage, as we learned this past year, even when you have tile drainage, if uh, we get too much rain, there's nothing we can do about it. But in most years, we, want, we can manage this with, with tile. Crop rotation is very important, like with any disease. Um, keeping soil pH, nutrient levels, just helping the plant be healthy. And then these next, so those are kind of general, especially with the root and crown diseases, the first few. And then these next ones with the check mark are things that are usually recommended for managing the foliar diseases. So control insects, because they make it more susceptible to foliar diseases a lot of times, or they interact with the diseases to cause it, that stress load to be more severe. Not keeping the cutting on a regular 30 to 35 day schedule will reduce your leaf diseases, okay? That's generally recommended. The longer you leave the crop out there, the more you're gonna get leaf disease infestation. Now, I actually saw the 28-day cutting on a trial this year be yield, compared to a fungicide, yield loss as much as a 35-day schedule. So I'm not completely convinced that cutting earlier helps, but intuitively it seems to make sense, but we need to keep collecting data. Um, that early harvest may reduce the damage. Wait until dew is off before mowing can help uh, with any of the diseases, buying resistant varieties if they're available. And again, I said, we don't have much information on that about foliar diseases. And uh, foliar fungicides now can be a tool and can be helpful uh, based on our data here the last few years. So I'm gonna cover that um, for the rest of, most of the rest of this talk. Okay, show you some data on fungicides. This is the table that was somewhat incomplete in the printed um, uh, proceedings, but I completed it. So these are the fungicides that are currently labeled for alfalfa in, um, here in Ohio, across the Midwest. Uh, you can pick out the foliar diseases that are in that list there if they're, uh, if they're intended to control it or reduce it or not. Um, there's um, the group, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with that, the group number is, um, indicates the, um, let me get this right, the target site of action of each chemical. And the idea is you can get resistance by the pathogen to these fungicides if you overuse a fungicide in the same group. Now notice, unfortunately, a lot of these have the same group. And some of them are tank mixes, like uh, what? Pristine and um, Priaxor are tank mixes of two different groups. <laughs> so, this is something that you have to manage and be careful with. Most of them you should not apply more than three times in a growing season, okay? And the rate is also um, uh, a factor in not applying too much. 
to get a resistance buildup. But the main thing is only apply it two to three times at the most in a growing season. I, I think two is probably better than three, um, mainly on the first and second cutting probably. Okay. Most of these, they say you have to apply before symptoms appear. They're not, they're preventative. They aren't, um, they can't fix it after you have the infestation, okay? So you're usually talking about applying these early in the growth cycle, about the time you'd probably apply a, an insecticide, especially during the summer for leaf hoppers, six inch growth or so okay, to get some good uh, cover. Um, now, again, there's the concern with development of fungal resistance, already talked about that, um, and repeated use, of course, will end up too much repeated use. Okay, I already covered this. So point out to growers, make sure to look at those restrictions on the label, follow them, look at the resistance management on the label. Now, just some results. There are some very visual results sometimes if disease, foliar disease development uh, is, if the environment is right for it. And you can get these kind of differences, nice green color versus yellowing, brownish, uh, foliar diseases developing. Um, you can see it on the stem, and you can actually see it in the stubble after you cut. The stubble will be more green versus very brown on fungicide versus no fungicide. So you can pick these out. It is actually something that you can see in the field. A lot of things we do in alfalfa you can't see. This one I've actually really seen, okay? Um, in Wisconsin, so here's some results from other states. In Wisconsin, the Fungicides, though, infrequently gave higher forage yields, okay? And infrequently had a positive return on investment. There is a better likelihood of response with longer cutting intervals in their data. Six years of trials in Iowa, they had a yield increase with fungicide was more likely in the first harvest. And although fungicide improved leaf retention, there was little improvement in nutritive value, okay? So when I first saw these results, I said, well, I can't get too excited about fungicides, but we have an environment, I think, that is more conducive to these foliar uh, diseases than they do in Wisconsin and Iowa. And uh, this is data um, from here in Ohio that we did in 2013 and 2014. We applied uh, headline and we applied it three times on the first, second, and third cutting. Again, I think you should only apply it in two cuttings. And those are our yield results. The yield improvement in 2013 was almost a ton and 2014 was a half a ton. I sometimes now wonder if we got less yield improvement because we applied three times in 2013. <laughs> Might be something to, to look at. There was a nutritive value improvement as well as yield, okay? Uh, the fungicide increased the relative forage quality by 12 points and crude protein by 1.6 percentage. This is a six state trial, well, three states that had the fungicide treatment here, Michigan and Ohio. And you can see the data there by cutting usually was significant in 2018, that difference between fungicide and no fungicide. This was with Priaxor, again, applied three times on the first three cuttings. The gain was about a, almost a half a ton, 7.7%, okay? And it was similar across harvest schedules, whether we were on a 28-day or a 35-day cutting schedule. We had basically the same improvement in yield. And here's some pictures from that. 
um, the fungicide versus the control. The bottom has less leaves in the control, a lot more dead leaves, a lot more stem visible compared to the bottom canopy of the fungicide tree. I have the data from Ohio this past year. Um, there's something else going on there with the low yields this year, of course, with all the rain, but there was something else I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, but again, we had almost a half a ton yield advantage with the fungicide, okay? All right, so economics of this, Assuming it costs $15 an acre for um, the fungicide product and $8 to apply it, you would add the $8 on maybe only in the spring, unless you're applying an insecticide for weevil. But in the summer, I'm assuming you only add the cost of the fungicide because you're going to be spraying for a leaf hopper in most cases, and this can be tank mixed with that spray. So that comes out to $53 an acre for three applications. And again, I think you should only apply twice. Here's the break even for yield improvement based on the price of hay. So even at $100 a ton, which is, uh, would be a very good deal for alfalfa right now, we would break even with about the yield improvement we've been getting on average, about a half a ton. If we're up to 150 or 200, which is closer to today, we're definitely getting a return on that investment. Okay? So something to think about, something to uh, be aware of. Okay, I'm gonna run on through this. Uh, again, fungicide benefit probably less likely, definitely less likely in late summer, more likely on the first cutting and second cutting. All right? Now, we had a lot more serious problems in leaf diseases this year, right? <laughs> this is from Sam Stratton in one of his growers. You could map the tile lines. Um, so there's nothing we can do about this, right? Hopefully this was an anomaly. I hope we don't see another year like we did this year. Um, there was something else going on, though, in, in a trial that was interesting that I want you guys to be aware of, and that's with Roundup Ready alfalfa. Any of you have growers using Roundup Ready alfalfa? Okay. We weren't able to apply Roundup in the fall of 2018 like we wanted to because of rain and wind. And um, so then we applied it in the spring in, in uh, late, late April. Uh, we had a good day, calm day, it was dry, and we decided to spray Roundup in the spring to clean up this trial. And a week and a half or so later, I started noticing, man, this trial doesn't look good. You can't see it real well here, but a lot of yellowing, the plants look weak, and I would have just written it off to the rain, okay, the wet weather we had, thinking, ah, oh, it's just drainage until I walked over to another trial that was twice as tall in the area of the farm where Joe calls it the swamp, okay? If anything, that should have been worse. It was, it was that alfalfa was up to mid-thigh, and like a few days later, it went down at Lodge because it was so big. We didn't get quite as much rain as you did, Sam, at Western Branch. So I started thinking about this and remembered that in California, they had had some trouble with spring applications of Roundup. So uh, I called the guy up and uh, then I, um, he recommended I send stems up to this researcher in Minnesota where I got these pictures. And um, just here's some more close-ups of, of what I was seeing. It almost looked like leafhopper yellowing, kind of yellowing of leaves and so forth. So what it turned out is this is a bacterial infection, Pseudomonas syringae, which is very prevalent in the air. It rains down. They actually use it as a nice nucleation agent for snowmaking because it's such an effective nucleation agent for, for, um, for uh, water. And it increases the frost susceptibility of the plant. 
we didn't get a freezing temperature, but we still had kind of these symptoms of this disease. And every stem I sent them was positive with a high number of colony forming units of this bacteria. They don't understand what's going on, but Roundup in the spring makes the plant more susceptible to this bacteria. Okay, so I'm going to retest this this coming spring. But if you have growers who <laughs> have Roundup ready, tell them maybe to wait till summer, okay, before they apply Roundup, not in the spring, and especially not on six inch alfalfa in the spring. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out to you, make you aware of it, maybe keep an eye out for it and uh, let me know if you see anything like this. But be warning your Roundup Ready alfalfa guys. All right. 